Okay, we are starting. Uh, Tim, you want to introduce? Sure. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Tim Condon. I'm product specialist at YSL Pro. We distribute Universal Audio and many other brands in Canada. We've worked with Noah for a long time. Uh, Noah and Dave Dice out of YSL Pro go back a long way. And Noah has been one of the most enthusiastic and passionate advocates for, for UA products in this country, in my books. And just fantastic. Um, every time we see Noah, we're hearing about how he's used UA products, uh, plugins in a different way, or hearing about his very new, just as we just did. So um, fantastic advocate for the brands and one of the top mastering engineers in Canada. Uh, before we hand over to you, Noah, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Dave Roman. I'm in New York City. I work for Universal Audio. Uh, today's, uh, well, this year is my 10th year, so I'll be celebrating my 10-year anniversary very shortly with UA. Um, also a mastering engineer, albeit uh, more of the, you know, as a side gig, if you will. Um, but I enjoy it very much, and I've been doing that for about 15 years or so. Um, and uh, as far as UA is concerned, I take care of sales. I'm the liaison to Canada, so really it's YSL Pro and uh, Tim and Dysart that I speak to uh, very often, usually two to three times a day, actually. Um, but um, they're the ones who actually take care of uh, all of that in Canada. I'm, I'm really just there, the conduit to, to UA, the company in California. Um, and then I also take care of all the sales accounts, uh, or at least the key accounts here in the Northeast United States. Um, yeah, and about, um, yeah, and I love talking about this stuff. And I think, uh, actually, I think all of, all three of us could just probably talk about this with nobody else in the room, <laughs> probably for a week straight, <laughs> if we didn't have to like, you know, have dinner or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so I guess my role today, because uh, we do these roughly weekly um, with uh, a lot of the stores throughout Canada, uh, and it's usually me yapping about all sorts of things, both sales and technical. Uh, but uh, the fact that we've got Noah here as a guest today, uh, I'm going to uh, let Noah speak uh, and, you know, maybe interject with a question or here or there uh, um, as, as it's as it's warranted. So, yeah, I guess without further ado, uh, Noah Mintz of Lacquer Channel, um, located in go. Toronto, correct? Great. That's that's me. Hi. Um, I'll just give you some quick uh, background about myself and uh, and uh, the studio and my relationship with uh, YSL and UAD. Uh, I've been mastering uh, since uh, 1998, so I'm really bad at math, so I, I guess it's like 89 years or something. And uh, I started at Lacquer Channel in 2001, and Lacquer Channel has been around since 1975. Um, we still have a lot of equipment from those days. There's a long history and a long name, and, and I'm, uh, I, I, it really, I really hold it dear to my heart and part of my identity. Um, with uh, YSL, um, at, which was, uh, uh, you know, I, YSL is a company, Longham McQuaid is a company, and HHP is a company. Uh, I've been going back since uh, the moment I got into music in Toronto. Uh, invaluable. Uh, my first guitar came from there. Uh, my first pro audio equipment, uh, uh, Dave Dysart, um, was invaluable not only for the equipment I needed to get started as a mastering engineer, but uh, just the contacts he's given me all throughout the years. And uh, he's also kept me uh, on the phone because I, uh, as soon as email and texting came along, I sort of abandoned the phone. But you always get that call from from D D D Dysart in my phone, and uh, and I always try to pick up on that one. So. And then uh, UAD, um, the second, like literally the, the day uh, UAD one was announced, I contacted Long McQuaid about purchasing one of the cards. And uh, I think I was probably one of the first people in Canada to own one. Um, and I got in on, on every single plugin that was good for mastering at that time. And uh, I, I, so I've been using UAD every single day since it came out. And, uh, obviously, uh, U82 was a big game changer um, when that came along, and uh, and I've integrated that in, into my workflow. Um, and now that there's uh, U U80X, uh, obviously, sort of the next generation of of, of UAD, um, but I still find UAD extremely valuable. Um, 
I, I don't upgrade my computer that often. Uh, and I usually, when I do, I go to a computer a couple years old and try to get the fastest one at that time. Um, and I'd rather spend money on gear and plugins. So, uh, so I find uh, UAD is invaluable uh, uh, to offload my DSP um, because I'm maxing it out all the time, especially with mastering plugins. You're putting it on the highest settings that's possible. And uh, I can go to 999 DSP really, really fast. So uh, having been able to offload that into um, DSP is still really important for me. Um, okay, so why don't we get right into how I how I do mastering? I think I should uh, sort of give a little primer about what I usually do before I even start getting into the plugin stuff. And what I'm going to do is when I talk about the plugin stuff, I'm going to uh, share my screen, and then I'll go back to this. So we're not always looking at the screen, not always looking at the plugins. I'm not going to share any audio. I feel I, it'll just be arbitrary. At this point. I think it's better just for workflow instead, just to show my workflow. Um, I'm a, I'm a big analog guy, as you can see here, lots of analog stuff. Um, so I have a workflow. Oftentimes my analog gear is actually just, I'm just using one piece and just to go in um, and I'm using that for the whole album. I'm not really adjusting it. Um, and then I'm doing everything in plugins after that. Um, so I'm just getting a sound of a piece of gear for the whole album, sort of, uh, giving it a vibe or a color or a shape. Um, and then sometimes I do full analog mastering where I'm doing changes per song, different EQs, different compressors. Um, but I'm always doing a, a analog pass and a plugin pass. And I try to, as objectively as possible, listen and decide which one's better. And uh, oftentimes, as, as many people will imagine, the plugins just sound better. Uh, a lot of people are working in the box. And uh, I think that's great. There's no, definitely no problem with working in the box. The only problem is if you don't have analog, you never know what it's going to sound like with the analog. Um, oftentimes, uh, kind of my workflow that I work with in analog, I just port to the plugin side. And uh, oftentimes, just I'll, if I use you know the same gear I have, but in plugins. Um, it often just sounds better for whatever reason. It's something in the mix, something in the way it's 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 coming across that analog just isn't improving it. Um, but somehow the same plugins I would use in analog just sound better. Uh, um, uh, just sound better in the in the in the box than they do in the actual gear itself. So uh, the first thing I do when I get an album um, is uh, I try to level everything out to a, a consistent level by ear. This is unmastered. And then I just listen. And uh, I usually spend, you know, a bulk of my time just listening to the album, getting really intimate with it, getting to know it. Um, I like to have it uh, some time before I start working on it so I can give it a, I can be extremely familiar before I start dialing any knobs. Um, and so once I'm pretty confident, once I know the way the album sounds, then I start playing with things. I try different things and see how they work. And there's no difference between doing that in the analog domain or in the box. I try different things and hear they sound. But over the years, I've sort of developed sort of ways of doing things that sort of work really well for me. And uh, I don't actually really even know if anyone else does it that way, but it's the way I do it. I'm hopefully just going to show you some of those things right now. And I'll just take you to my uh, to my DAW and then just remind you, I'm not playing any audio. So if you see audio going, you'll just see my meters, um, but you won't actually hear anything. I, want, I wanted to go back a second, just uh, sure. help define uh, something that uh, you mentioned, which you know, everyone may not be intimately familiar with. Uh, when when Noah refers or when any of us refer to uh, UAD, we're typically talking about plugins that are running on DSP inside of either our interfaces or our DSP accelerators, whether they're PCIe cards or a satellite. And when uh, we refer to UADX, that is uh, some of those same plugins that are actually coded to run natively. 
And, you know, within a session, if, if, uh, well, you, if, if you own the license for one, you own it for both. So you could run it on DSP, you could run it on natively. And sometimes there's a, there's a reason to do that. Um, uh, switch between one or the other. We don't need to really need to get into the, the nitty gritty of that. Uh, but that's what we mean uh, when we're talking about UAD versus UADX. And as Noah brings up plugins, uh, you'll notice that some of them, you know, on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, will say UAD and others won't. And so like the, the sort of surround, the, 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 in, um, the main central GUI will be identical. Uh, and the audio would be identical, by the way, between the two. Uh, but the surrounding little border may change slightly. So that'll be the difference between UAD and UADX. Yeah, and the, and the difference between the, the two um, really is uh, um, that you don't, uh, they kind of work sort of vice versa. Like if, you're, if you don't have enough uh, CPU power, you can go to the UAD version. If you don't have enough DSP, you can go to the UADX version. So uh, it really allows you to use as many UAD plugins as you want. Just a, another question, um, Noah, before you start jumping into, into the approach. Uh, can you explain uh, to folks that maybe aren't too aware of what mastering is, what you see as your role as a mastering engineer and, and why it's essential? Yeah, of course. Um, and that changes all the time, the, the explanation of what mastering is. These days, I'm sort of going with, um, it's making it sound good as in, and as many different playback systems as possible. Generally, you're creating one master, and uh, that's got to sound good on a Bluetooth speaker. Has to sound good on a in a club. Has to sound good on a big system. Has to sound good on YouTube. Has to sound good on Spotify. Has to sound good on Spot on on title. It has to sound good on as many systems as possible. Um, oftentimes, uh, these days we get uh, reference masters. It means the mix engineer has done a master, and sometimes those reference masters sound more hype and louder than the master I would do. And I have to explain that, well, just take the one I've done and listen to it as many different places as possible. And then listen to the one, the reference one, did, the reference master and see which one you prefer. And oftentimes it comes up, yeah, for some reason yours just plays back on more systems, you know, and it's like, uh, so that's like, and it's basically, um, uh, what I do for mastering is I basically set the like the overall tone, like the bass and the treble, and then the compression. So leveling it out a little bit, um, sort of rebalancing uh, it, um, but really thinking about every possible playback system. And there's more playback systems than there's ever been. So and you can play back on anything. And a lot of those Bluetooth speakers are mono, so being conscious of the fact that you may have mono playback so and make sure when you when you sum to mono it, you don't lose instrumentation or or lose the the depth that it has so um i find it's it's mastering is more important than ever and uh and what's most important about mastering uh i mean gears i i love gear most of us love gear that's that's really important um the, we all, most of us have hundreds of plugins. We love that, but hearing it in a good room and with good monitoring and knowing how to make those decisions. So mastering is being able to listen to and adjust it in a room that is, is flat from say 27 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. So you can actually hear what you're working on. And I always encourage people to listen. Thank you. And are you listening through the same pair of monitors throughout, or are you jumping between different? I mean, from a mixing perspective, a lot of engineers have multiple pairs of monitors. Are you doing the same thing, or is it that you know the sound of your room and those monitors so well that you know if it sounds good in that environment, it'll translate? Yeah, we have we have one pair of monitors. We're sort of old school like that. All the a lot of the old mastering studios, um, like from our era era from the seventies, have a single pair of large monitors in soffit mounts. So they're mounted up in the ceiling, they're sorry, in the, in the wall. Uh, so we just have one pair, they're really big and really heavy. Um, and and, uh, and they, they're they capable of, of really hearing the subtleties in the music. So I just have the one pair, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Should we move on to the little demo here? Okay, so sure. I'll, I'll switch to my screen and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back after after if, if there's anything for me to talk about just without the screen needed so
Okay. Hopefully you see my screen. I'm going to show you what's going on here. You see my mouse, I assume, I hope. Yes. And yeah. so I'm going to play. Again, you won't hear anything. So am I the top right hand side, this meter? Um, these are the these two meters I use. I find them invaluable for mastering. I also have a physical VU meter. So um, I, I, I find a analog VU meter is really important for me to really know how loud something is. But because we do a lot of vinyl work, um, this meter in the top, top right here uh, shows me uh, phase uh, by frequency. So I can see if any frequencies are out of phase, uh, which can cause problems with uh, the stylus in, in lacquer cutting um, or cause problems with uh, summing down to mono. So, and then here is just, uh, just a, a, a frequency amplitude meter. Um, it's nice to look at, it's fun to look at. Um, I think it looks really cool. And the only thing I really use it for um, is just looking at it and I sort of, I can tell it immediately if something's wrong. It doesn't really tell me what to do or what not to do. Um, most of the times I just look at it and it just looks pretty. Um, but if I see there's something happening that shouldn't be happening, that's the first, I'll see it before I can hear it. And as soon as I see it, uh, then I'll hear it. Then I'll know, I'll know it's there and I can't not unhear it until I fix it or until the mixing engineer fixes it. So it's really, those are the only two meters I really need. Um, I, I mean, a peak meter is good. I also have a TC electronic loudness meter, which is great too. Um, but visually, those are the two things I need. I need to know if it's in phase, if everything's in phase or what is out of phase. And I need to know um, if there's any amplitude issues. Um, so the DAW I'm using is Sequoia. It's, it's quite popular in mastering. Uh, um, it doesn't matter what die you use anymore. It used to. Now it really doesn't. Use whatever you want. Um, and uh, the other thing I use, which is a bit unique, um, is uh, Blue Cat Patchwork. So I load all my UAD plugins into that. There's a couple of reasons I do that. Um, one is it allows me to run parallel plugins that don't allow parallel. Parallel is a very important part of my uh, uh, process. Uh, and the other thing is um, Sequoia, if uh, sometimes if a plugin gets lost or moved, um, it will tell you it's gone. And unless you put it back in the same spot, uh, um, you, it, it, it won't load it back in. So uh, the Blue Cat patchwork allows you to relocate the plugin. So if it's missing, so that's, that's really helpful. But you'll see my workflow and it's just, um, it just works so well with UAD. It's like any problems that happens, the happening of loading a plugin into my DAW, it eliminates it. So um, especially when I'm running, like right now I'm running a 99% DSP. So the keeping them all compartmentalized here is really great. So, so after I've done a lot of listening, um, one of the first things I'll do is load in the UAD 102. Now, I have a preset um, that uh, made by me, and uh, and it's we have a, a the same machine here, and I just sort of matched my machine back and forth as closely as possible. Now, I'm not as much going for the tape effect as I'm going for the hiss effect. Um, I like to keep like a minus 70 hiss going throughout a whole program if it's very sort of analog sounding. That way we never go to zero. So I can sometimes just load this plugin on an empty track um, and just have it running through the whole program or automate it so it's not running during the audio, but it's running during the fade outs and fade ins. Um, so it's never going down to zero. We're never getting this digital black. And that just gives me the sound of my console, sound of my tape machine. Um, we used to call it uh, machine tone uh, back in the day, the early days. Um, and I find um, it's, uh, it just adds something that, um, that's missing from, from most plugins, noise. <laughs> you know, it has noise built right into it. Uh, and I only use the hiss function for that. 
Um, but if I'm running it on the program itself, um, I just start with the UAD ATR with my setting and I see if it improves it or not. Um, most often than not, it's not needed, but sometimes it's palatable and you're just like, wow, this is, uh, this sounds, this just does something, you know? And it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's the sound of tape. And if you got acoustic guitars or you have anything that's like rock music and it's, it's better, I, th I find virtual tapes better than virtual tubes. So um, I, uh, I, I use it often. Um, I don't always keep it on, but I always sort of gravitate towards it. But then again, very often I'll move it to a track um, and then I'll just keep it, uh, I'll just keep it running with no audio, but just, just for that, just for that, that noise. So Noah, are you, do you, um, do you transfer your stuff to tape first or, you know, I'm trying to figure out like when you use this as tape, like, or not. And is it, is that because, you know, you, you're actually using real tape? No, I, I don't use real, real, real tape very often, but okay. Um, it's, I it gets more because of the noise that all the gear has noise and that's going, you know, and, and one of the tricks that George Graves, my, uh, mentor, uh, taught me was record the sound of the noise of your equipment just with no audio and run that in between songs. So I still think in terms of the LP. Mm -hmm. So I think when I'm doing an album, I want it as an album. So when people listen to it, it's not going down to to super quiet. So even if my tape effect is is on the audio, it's still I still try to keep it really subtle and not putting it into saturation. So it's just getting that sort of little tape sound. Um, but uh, more often than not, it's just going on a track just to add a little bit of noise in between songs um, because it does have that noise knob, which most plugins don't have like the actual noise of the tape machine, the machine noise. Um, but I don't lay back the tape very often anymore. Um, it's too expensive with tape. Um, but my gear, like my tubes, because we have a lot of old gear here, the sound of the tubes and the sound of transformers is tape. Yeah. So we're not, we're not really getting that sound in, in, in plugins. You know, some plugins obviously have transformer sound and that kind of stuff, but they're silent. They go down to digital black every single time gear doesn't do that so the atr 102 plugin doesn't do that if you put noise on it never goes down to digital black it always has noise so that's what's so unique about it and so cool about that plugin and it gets a lot of use in that respect now now in, when I master an analog, the my go-to setup is my Neve EQ and my Manly Varimu. So very often I will call up the same sort of thing. So this is a 1081. Now people, most people would be thinking, why is he using a 1081 in mastering? That's not a mastering EQ. Well, my Neve equalizer is the mastering version of the 1081. And you know what? The 4.7K, which I use a lot, and the 56 Hertz sounds very much like my, my piece of gear. Like when I boost that 56, it sounds the same as boosting the 56. So one of the little, my little secrets or my little ways of doing things is a little boost at 4.7 shelving and a little boost at 56, peak. Um, so sometimes I'm just doing that. Oh, and maybe the 27 filter. You know, you don't, not a lot of plugins have, have these filters like this, like just a, a simple filter. So this 27 Hertz filter in the Neve is, I think is magical and it's great. That just stays at zero. And I just run that through. And then I'll run into the Varimu. Varimu, um, I love Parallel. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but uh, the Varimu is one of the things I generally don't ever use in parallel. It's a tube device. It's got five tubes per side. Um, it has a sound. So I want that whole sound. I don't want partial sound. So that, so generally I'll leave that mix knob off 
Um, and I usually keep my input like, like if I were to, if you were to look at um, uh, my mastering version of the very me would be a minus four. So in the UAD version, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd bring the level down a little bit and put my output up a little bit. My attack generally on the very mu stays slow. Uh, and my threshold stays max until I'm getting a little compression. I don't know why it's not. Oh, I don't have it on. Sorry. So, and I just sort of bring that threshold down. So there's a little bit of compression. Probably in this case, I'd probably have to bring my input up a little bit and then bring my threshold down. So if for me mastering something that's sort of rock or indie or like acoustic or anything, anything that like needs a little vibe, this Neve Manly combination is my first go-to. And if that sounds great, I may not do anything more beyond that. I, I should mention that I'm not a very technical person, that that I'm like the, like as much as I, I love and respect Bob Katz, I'm like his opposite. Like he's a smart guy, I'm the dumb guy. Like, so I kind of just turn knobs till they sound good. Um, and I don't really understand the mechanics behind things so much. And I don't know the numbers thing, I don't really know like I just want it to sound good. So like oftentimes it allows me oftentimes to have like a, a naivety and use something that other people may not use because I don't know any better. So um, so if the Neve and the Manly sounding really great, uh, then I'll just do that. And I'll just say, this is good. But now I haven't really got any level. I'm generally keeping those unity because if you remember, I said that I'm leveling everything out to begin with. So I've got, it's going in at the level I kind of want it to go into. And I, I usually kind of stick around the minus uh, 14 luffs um, as playback into my system. I think that's a great target for playback of the mix to mastering. And, and then I pretty much keep these two unity, maybe a little bit of gain out of the manly. Um, and then I'll go straight into what I do for loudness. Um, because I don't have to, I won't have to go back to that later. And I'll tell you all the other things I like to do with the UAD, but for loudness, loudness is basically a, a, a four step process. So the first process is, and I consider this part of the loudness. Oh, not that one. This one. Yeah. First step of the loud part of the loudness is my shaping EQ, my finishing EQ. And why I don't consider it part of my EQ stage is because it's after all my EQing, after all my compression, after everything I've kind of liked the way it sounds, I load up a finishing EQ, just sort of in the, the Poltec's a great one. Usually there's something with wide strokes in it. Uh, Poltec's a really good one for that. And I'm using, um, once I get into the setting my loudness, after I've set my loudness, I'm using like, between one and zero. I'm just using a little bit of boost, a little bit of attenuation um, based on uh, how it's sounding. So with the Poltec, I love just the trick, a little bit of boost, a little bit of cut. Um, the 12K on this UAD Poltec is magical. I have a bunch of Poltecs, uh, passive EQs, and this, the 12K sounds, sounds the best in all of them. I got that from my friend, Howie Beck. He's like, the 12K sounds amazing. And it's like, you're right, so I use it all the time. I usually keep my bandwidth about five, a little bit of boost, and then maybe like a two dB boost and then a one dB attenuation. But again, like I'm kind of setting this arbitrary right now because then I'm gonna go into my, I'm gonna go into my, my, my loudness to get my loudness. And as I adjust my loudness, I'll also adjust my finishing EQ. Uh, so I'm gonna start from the back. So, um, and again, this is the way I do it. This is. I've done it for the last few years, and this is my little way of doing it. So I go, instead of setting going forward, I start from the last thing I do, second last thing to do, and the third last thing I do. So almost everything I master goes through the inflator at the very end after my limiting. Um, so again, I'll set it arbitrarily. I'll set maybe like 20% like effect, 
the curve usually plus a little bit. And I put that to the side. Uh, clip zero, band split off. Um, limiter, UAD doesn't have a lot of options for limiting um, at the moment. Hint, hint, UAD, get, get on the limiter game. Um, so in this case, I'll use the Weiss. Um, oftentimes I'll use the Weiss or any limiter at 50% uh, parallel um, because I'm going into this inflator. Uh, I just like the way it sounds, a little more transparent. I can add three dBs of gain and you're really only getting probably about two dB, uh, one and a half dBs of gain out of it. So, because you're at 50% parallel, I, if it works that way, I, I, I think it does. Uh, and then this effect maybe about 25%. So that usually stays where it is. I sort of put that aside. Don't really think about it again. So now comes the, the shape of the limiter. Uh, uh, again, I don't really know if other people do it this way, but I do it this way. And it's like, so I'll use a multiband compressor in parallel to get the shape of the sound going into the limiter because the limiter changes the sound of the program. So as soon as you add volume, that Fletcher Munson curve comes into play, especially if you're gonna be adding three or four dBs of volume, everything sounds different. So you wanna kind of shape it back to the way it was. So if I'm using this one, the UAD precision, um, I'll sort of set it to zero to start and sort of just go into each band. Make sure it's on, yeah, it's on. Um, and I'll start, you know, compressing until until I, I see it moving a little bit. Uh, is it going? What am I looking into? It's doing something wrong here. Okay. There we go. Anyway, so I'm getting a little, you see, I'm adding all this gain here. So I'm doing a little bit of compression. I'm not sure. Maybe there's no bass in this track, but anyway, um, that's a way too much compression. So a little bit of compression. And then uh, this adds, instead of a de -esser, I might do a little compression in the high there. I'm just sort of going visually, just trying to get a little compression out of it. And then if I feel like the mid needs to, to, to uh, balance out a little bit, I might compress that or I might expand it. Right now I have it set for expand. Um, and just a little bit of expansion in there. I mean, that's maybe a little bit too much, but, but basically it's just sort of kissing all the, I'm not actually doing anything because my mix is at zero. So, and then I start blending it in a little bit and then adjusting it based on that. And that's again, just into my limiter to get it to sound. So I'm getting some gain here because I've got all this gain in there. So every time I bring my mix up, I'm getting a little I'm feeding some gain into my limiter. My limiter is going to be working a little bit harder. Um, but I want it to sound the way it sounded before I, I had a limiter on there. So it's like a multi-process. So the, the between the multi-band compressor, the limiter and the inflator, I'm getting that sound of loudness. Um, and then for vinyl, I can turn off the inflator and I can turn down the limiter. Um, and I can either use uh, this Precision Multiband, which is a bit of an older plugin, but it still works amazing. It has a parallel function and has expansion, which is great. Um, or I could use the Oxford. And I run the Oxford Dynamic EQ. I run it in another patchwork so I can run it in parallel because it doesn't have a parallel function. That parallel function is really important. So sometimes it's only like a few percent, like 20, 30 percent, but it's just getting a sound. And I can do expansion too. It's getting a sound, a, a shape into the limiter. So to me, it's part, because it's dynamic, it's part of the limiting process. Um, so once I've got everything set there and I've got the loudness I desire and the sound I desire, I go back to this 
and I shape it a little bit more. So I'm shaping that that sound uh, of the uh, EQ going into the limiter, but it's it's a, it's before everything else. So I just want to want to shape that and sort of do that till it's sounding the way I'd like, and then I go backwards and go back to my EQs. And if this is good, if this is great in my compression, if this is all sounding really good, then I'm pretty much ready to go. But if I want to do further tweaks, I might just keep this going on and then go into a either a surgical EQ or another um, uh, anything where they, they can do a, a nice tight Q that I can sort of uh, shape the balance a little bit more. So my go-tos on this are uh, the Brainworks, the Curve Bender, and my favorite by far, the Hitsville. Um, great thing about the Hitsville uh, is running in an MS. So MS, link off, and then I'll basically just use the mid and not ignore the S unless I just want to kind of widen the stereo a little bit. But um, my analog EQs are set for mid side for the most part. And basically I'm just, I'm not really doing much side work at all. I just sort of stick with the mid. If you listen to most program material, most of the information's happening in the mid anyways. Uh, if very little is happening in the side, I can just generally just leave the side alone. And then, and, and then after I've got my EQ I like, whatever it is, um, then I can widen up my stereo image. I basically only use the side to widen up the stereo image. I don't really use it for corrective stuff. Um, I try, there's other ways of doing that. I generally do any most correcting stuff in, in stereo. Um, um, but it's great for widening, great for uh, making things a little more exciting. This Hitsville is, uh, I think, probably, I think probably the best plugin on the market right now. It's, 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 they just got it right. It has vibe, it has a sound, it has, like it's one of the first EQs that's ever come out for me that I sort of said, oh, I have nothing else that sounds like this, analog or, or, or plugins. It has its own sound, it's, it's, it's really great. It's really awesome. Um, it's like the bass can be can be tubby, but like not overblown. And this little half speed thing is kind of cool. Like it's like basically for half speed mastering when you you know you cut a lacquer at half the speed, um, you'd have to change the frequencies to half. You'd half the frequencies too after you made your deci decision. So you weren't so when it was sped up again, it wasn't you weren't EQing the wrong frequencies. But this is really handy because. Um, you got this 5K, which can be really sibilant, and you probably aren't going to use that as a peak. But as a uh, at, at 2500, it's awesome. And then 1K is great too. So it just gives you this great variation, you know. And it's like, um, but again, these are more even though uh, these are more wider strokes. So it's just sort of adding on to it. I might just decide uh, to use the Hitsville and turn off the the Neve. And go, oh, this is better. Um, the the UAD, uh, the, the BX Digital uh, is an incredible surgical equalizer. It's, uh, um, I've been using it since version one. It's at version three right now. Um, I was, I'm pretty sure I was one of the first people to purchase the, the version one when it came out. Um, I was pretty excited about it. I kind of became friendly, friendly with the developer at the time, Dirk, and uh, and I was just going on how great of a of an of a equalizer it is. Um, you can just really get in there and like the, these these cues are tight and uh, find that frequency you want. Um, in analog, how we're finding that frequency is just by boosting it up and then sweeping. Uh, but you don't have to do that in this. You can just put on the uh, auto listen um and uh and you can hear the frequency and it's really great in that way so i can find that resonant frequency once i find that resonant frequency you can see it there in the little display um 
then I can just cut it. Uh, and you got these wonderful uh, presence shift, a little bit of dynamic EQ, which is like a de uh, um, Again, it's just playing with these knobs until it sounds right. You know, it's like, I'm not really looking at my frequencies. I'm just listening to hear what frequencies are resonant to me, which frequencies are, are sticking out to me. Do you ever um, use the stereo widener on it? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I'll use I'll use uh, uh, mid side for that for stereo widening. Um, I'm not. Uh, I I find side EQ is probably the best way to get stereo widening. I'm not a big fan of stereo wideners. There is one built into Sequoia which I use pretty often, but it's like uh, you'd be hard pressed to hear it on or off. I just kind of use it because it does a little something. Um, but that side mid side EQ is really great for that. Just it it it's the best way to get widening in my in my uh, in my idea. So uh, the other little sort of UAD trick I do is uh, hertz and kilohertz. Um, I can just run uh, basically uh, the hertz and C and kilohertz in, both in C and you just add a tiny little bit of it. And then again, I can, cause it has no parallel. I can just sort of blend it in a little bit. It just adds something. It's like a, it's like a spectral equalizer. I've got a Dolby spectral EQ and this is these two very underrated, very overlooked plugins are probably as close to it as possible. And they, I do believe if you have them in these settings, they are a bit dynamic. Um, so you just, if you need to add a little bit more bass, a little bit more presence, uh, they're really great for that. I just love having a mix. So I can just mix it in a tiny little bit. Everything I do is in subtleties. So that's why parallel is so important for me. Um, because except for like the Manly Verimu, the, most things I don't want the full sound of them. I want just a little bit to blend into it. And then if I need more, I'll use more. So the Kurtz and kilohertz are great in parallel. Like they sound wonderful. Um, if it needs that enhancement, uh, again, I will only use them if it needs it. Um, oh, and I also had, because I have the API mastering EQ here, um, uh, UAD has a faithful reproduction of the 550A Problem is only two dBs. Uh, that's how the device is. That's how it was originally done. It's a faithful reproduction. So um, if I use it in parallel, I can do two dBs and I don't actually get two dBs. I can just get a lot less of that. Um, and you get that API sound, these broad strokes, but they're like, sometimes nothing sounds as good as an API. So uh, being able to run it in parallel really helps. Uh, and I can just do like a little 10K, a little 3K and a little 50 Hertz. And usually that sounds great. Two dBs of all that is probably too much. So I go my little mix knob and maybe just do 30% of that. And it sounds amazing. Now, my go-to compressors, uh, um, because we're doing sort of analog style today, sometimes uh, I'll use the, uh, the Elysia, Elysian whatever compressor. That's a very transparent compressor. It's really great, but I wanna sort of stick to my analog style mastering here. So my sort of go-to's are the solid state logic and the 2500. Now, they both have parallel built into them. Um, but the coolest thing about using this Blue Cat uh, patchwork is you can do something you can't really do easily for mastering an analog. You can run them in parallel with each other as opposed to in series. So if I turn them both on, they both get 50% of the signal. So I'm keeping them a mix at 100%. And they're both being fed 50% signal right now. And, and they're spitting that out. So it's beginning 100% of the signal. So I can get the sound of the API 2500 and the solid state logic uh, G compressor at the same time. And I can do a little bit of compression of each, and then they blend at 50% towards each other, and you get a whole new sound that you wouldn't have. Um, otherwise, you could never do in the analog domain. Um, 
Uh, they're both punchy compressors. Um, and oftentimes when I'm doing like uh, hip hop or, or, or funk, like I'll just use the SSL, but like somehow this combination of these two, it's like, it's like, I don't know, I'm like fucking with nature. It's like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a, a box that has an API and an SSL in it, or you'd have to use them in series. Um, but this is a way I can use them both together. They're both getting the same signal and, blend, and blending it together. So a really unique way to be able to use uh, these awesome UAD plugins uh, uh, in parallel as opposed to series. And I do have the 2500 and uh, it's pretty crazy how close this one sounds. Cause it's funny because the Manly doesn't quite sound like my Manly, it's his own thing. Um, it has the softness of it, which I really like and why I would use it, but they sound, the analog sounds very different. Of course, main reason for that is every very mu has different tubes in it. They're different age. Um, they might have a T-bar mod. They might have a different right. bunch of different things. This is one manly. Every manly in the rack sounds different. This sounds like one manly. So this doesn't sound like my manly, but it sounds like a manly. Whereas this 2500 sounds like my 2500. The only difference is if I hit it really hard, it distorts in a very different way than my hardware hits. So the hardware, it seems to be able to handle um, unlimited volume into it, but it's very different because it's analog volume. Um, you're not getting a uh, full scale into it. So, uh, but this combination of solid state logic and API together is just something that's really unique and something I go to uh, quite often actually, more, more than using one of them on their own. Good uh, question. Yeah, oh. go ahead. Uh, does the patchwork, so this is from Jonathan, does the patchwork program correct levels for summing in parallel automatically? If not, how do you set up, set your levels? Okay, yes. So basically, if you just see it here, so if I put in just the SSL, that's 100%. If I put in an empty one, that's, it's going through at 50% and then nothing at 50%. Um, so it's always keeping it at unity. Now, you also have an input and an output level. So I can, I can boost up the input to it and, and reduce the output to it. So that's even before, of course I could do that in the compressor itself, but it allows me to do that. So it allows me to, to play with those, those levels going in and out. So I can boost that, keep that level. I can, that one, I can reduce that. So we're sort of staying, staying Unity. Again, I mostly work in Unity when it comes to analog style mastering. I tend not to do a lot of gain, um, maybe three dBs gain, but considering a lot of the work I do, maybe it's eight or nine dBs gain overall, that's not a lot of gain. All my gains coming from the limiting stage or the loudness stage. Um, so one of the little trick I like to do, I have an, uh, an Avalon uh, 737, I'm oh, sorry, 747. Um, it's a stereo device. The, Avalon 737 is a mono device, but of course, since it's a plug-in and since UAD has it, you can use it in stereo. And it just does something that, uh, it's why people use Avalon. It has a sound that that's different than anything else. So you can use a little bit of compression, you get the sound of the tube in there and a little bit of EQ. Uh, you can put the EQ before the compressor and, uh, Kind of like a, just, but sometimes just going through it, it does something. It's not, um, it's not neutral. Like it's not a, a device where you, a, a plug-in where you just put through it and what you put in with what you, what you get out, it, it does something. There's like a, a sound of the tubes, which I always kind of wondered what that is. What is, what is a plug-in doing trying to emulate a sound? I have no idea. Um, but I think very few plugins do it well. This one does it well, best because you can't really adjust the tube. It's just going through the tube. So that sound uh, I like, and sometimes I'll just, I'll just use it. Like things that you wouldn't know, like the Vox box, like you can use the Vox box in mastering, which is crazy. Like you could never use that in the real world. So uh, 
I mean, I suppose you could, but it would be really weird. So um, trying to get things, uh, plugins that aren't necessarily used for mastering in mastering can yield pretty amazing results. Um, and again, this might be a little too heavy handed. So I can run it, but then if I just put in another insert, now I've got it in 50% parallel without even adjusting the parallel overall of my, of my, uh, of, of the whole thing. Uh, it's just a, a little twerk, a little uh, tweak that works great with, uh, with these UAD plugins that, um, uh, that, that don't have a parallel function. So, and, uh, oh, and then uh, a curve bender again, just another good shaping EQ that sounds, I don't know, Dave would, would say more than me because he has one, but how close, I don't know how close it sounds to the hardware, but um, it sounds really, I mean, I soft too, but the developers are an awesome company. I have their similar Abbey Road stuff. Uh, I just trust it. I trust it sounds uh, the hard, it, it sounds close to the hardware because it just sounds really good. And I've been using that since the day it came out as well. To me, it sounds close enough to the hardware that sometimes I'll use it like if I run out of bands. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so, that's basically my, my workflow. I don't overthink it. Um, I just kind of put things through and, and I, I'm not a big like, uh, like um, RX person or somebody who goes through and tries to like fix problems. I just try to work. I just try to make them sound good. If I got to fix something, I'll fix it. Um, but generally I try to respect whatever the mix is. Um, uh, as far as rendering goes, um, I have a separate computer that does all my rendering. So once I've done my project, um, I just open it uh, through um, a, a VPN, the other computer, and I, I load it in. And then I can just have everything rendering out. So it doesn't matter how long anything takes. Um, it's just rendering out while I can do other things. So I hope that's been a pretty good explanation of how I use uh, uh these plugins and uh, how my workflow works. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if anyone has. I think you've sold at least one Blue Cat license today because <laughs> um, it, yeah. it just works great for 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 uh, some of these older UAD plugins before Parallel was like a um, was like in fashion, you know? Well, yeah. And also it, it kind of um, it, it's something that I've I mean, I, I've, I've talked about this with various things that we deal with at UA, um, you know, in the, whether it's the guitar world like Ox or or just gear, but you're you're unlocking with this workflow with Blue Cat and the parallel workflow that you're talking about. You're unlocking more potential tools, like yeah. you, like you already mentioned that there are certain things that in the analog domain you would have never thought about using for mastering. Well, the plugin version of that, well, now you can, and and there's there's other stuff I'm sure too, that helps that, you know, the fact that you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about, um, well, you've got recall on plugins, for example, right? Like, you know, there's all that, but now you're adding yet another element to it. The fact that you can do this stuff in parallel. So if you do have something that you, you know, if you, if you had the analog equivalent of it and you patched it in, you're like, yeah, that's way too colorful. That's going way too far in that direction. But by introducing it parallel, then you can just dial that color in just a little bit. And all of a sudden it becomes another you know, crayon in the, in the, and that's, in the, and that's how, yeah, that's how I work in analog too. Like I just got this DECA compressor and, and it's just too heavy to use in non-parallel. So it's pretty much always used at 50% parallel. Same with my API compressor. Um, uh, of course the UAD has the parallel built into it, like the 2,500 plus, but I'm almost always use it at 50%. I just think it sounds best that way, you know? And again, I try to, I try to use wide brush strokes for everything. I'm kind of like old school that way. I don't really try to get surgical. I have a couple of surgical EQs I use, but I try not to do surgical unless I have to. I really want to respect the mix, you know? And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, like sometimes I just get it wrong. Like the artists and the producer listen to it and and uh, they're like, oh, we love what you did, but it's it doesn't, it's not really working for us. We kind of hope to go a little bit. You take it, you take it further. You take it like, like we loved the mix, but we didn't, we weren't in love with the mix. We wanted it more. So I always offer unlimited revisions and I'm always happy to reinterpret everything. And often, funny enough, oftentimes I'll do an all analog master and they're just, 
there's something they're unhappy with. And then I'll copy exactly what I did in the analog master in the box. And they're like, this is it. Like, it's like, it's like exactly what I did without the analog satur actual analog saturation. It's like fake analog saturation, but they like that better. You know, it's like something about it is just, it's just, it hits better. And it's like, so the whole fun of mastering is trying different things and having all these tools and, and like, and like, and like, like trying different approaches. So when people are afraid to ask me for revisions and it's like, I'm like, no, like, let's just, let's just try something completely different. And, if, and you'll see if you like it better because there's no right way to do it. I, all those plugins I loaded up, I could try any one of those. I can master with any one of those plugins. Like my, my philosophy on, 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 on the, the, the job of mastering is that I could teach anyone to master in a day. Anyone who's an audio engineer, I could teach them to master in a day or less. It's just going to take you years to get any good at it. Not to say, I mean, I'm doing, doing it 23 years. I really hope I'm good at it. But I think I'm like, what I'm good at is trying to find how I think it should sound and then listening to the artists after they listen to that. And then if they say it's great, it's great. If they if they're like, uh, then I can listen to what they're saying. And then between what I did, between what they're saying, find the sound they're looking for. You know, and it's that's the fun in it. The fun is doing the work, not doing the the math for me anyway. Uh, a question from Andre. Uh, do you have any go-to plugins that you simply run through similar to how hardware would act in a similar way, transformer sound, tubes, et cetera? This applies yeah. to your Avalon from my understanding. The well, the ATR 102 for sure. Yeah, that's 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 the that is that sound. You just go through it. You don't you don't really tweak it that much. It's not really meant to be tweaked. Like that's not how a tape machine works. Um, so you go through it. Uh, the I beyond that, I that Hitsville for sure. The um, the Hitsville the Hitsville uh, often I'll use one setting for the whole album. I won't tweak it. So I'll just put it on my master bus and just keep it on there. And it's like, and then I'll master into it. That one's, it's just such a wide stroke thing. And it's really cool. And like, I know there is a, a heritage, I guess, released a hardware version. I'd love to hear that. But but the plugin is just so good. I don't think I could, uh, I, I don't think I could be convinced to, to, to use hardware in that one. It's just, it just works. Um, I'd love to meet the people who developed that one. It's really, uh, it's really cool, and there's other things like um, other couple like the the a, a little more of the esoteric plugins, like the little secret plugins you'd use. Like sometimes even just the deesser in the box box sounds has its own sound. You know, it's like you can run that through a whole mix, and it sounds really cool. So, uh, and the precision deesser is really cool. I don't think it has a vibe though, but yeah, I wouldn't use that for a vibe. But but definitely the tape machine is the number one thing for vibe for sure, and it's awesome. Uh, Ellen M. Pickering is asking roughly how long does it take to master a song on average? And I'll, I'll add to that. Do you find that it varies between uh, attended or unattended? So attended, uh, I want to be as, as candid as possible about this um, because attended, you do want to take more time. Um, but in that respect, because sometimes albums could take like five minutes, you knew exactly well, not album. A song could take like 10 minutes, you knew exactly what you're doing, what you want to do. But that experimental work is happening when the client is here. So when the client comes in, if I'm convinced I want to do it a certain way, I try it a few different ways uh, uh, during the time while they're here. Um, so uh, so we all can hear that and we all can, so I'm taking. Uh, extra time when the client's here just to see what it would sound like. I'm almost always going back to the way I originally did it, like um, like 99%. But I want the client to know, hey, if I put it through this device, this is how it sounds. I'll, like it's a, more of an interactive process. Um, the only way I can do it, because I don't charge more for attended, the only way I can do attended set sessions uh, is to have a lot of sessions that aren't because they take so much longer to do. Um, so, but to answer the question, how long does it take to master a song? Uh, anywhere from five minutes to two hours. Um, it depends on the mix itself. Um, a really great mix can take sometimes two hours to master because I don't know how to improve it. So it takes so long to try to figure out how to improve it. 
sometimes just to get to the conclusion that I don't need to do almost anything to it. Maybe just a little volume, that's it. And then sometimes volume changes the sound of it, like we talked about before. So I got to do a little EQ just to get it sounding the way it sounded like before it was mastered after there's some volume to it. But then sometimes it takes like 10 minutes, five minutes to master a song and I just know I'm done. Like it sounds great. And I'm just running it through my Neve and it sounds fantastic. Or I'm just running it through something. It's like, it's like, it all depends on how much the mix is, is I'm understanding it. I'm understanding what they're doing. If there's technical issues, it's obviously gonna take longer. But if it sounds really great, it's going to take longer. So it's that sort of stuff that's like, like middle ground, that really, the stuff that really needs mastering, that actually takes the least amount of time because everything I do sounds great. So then I just have to choose the thing that I most, I feel sounds the best to me. So, but that, it's just, it's, it's 23 years. It doesn't take me very long to get a sound I really like out of it. So it's, it really varies, you know, depending on, uh, but the most important part, the mo thing it takes the longest, which I don't account for is the listening. Because if I get an album three or four days before or a couple of weeks before, I'll be listening to it. I'll listen to it while I'm cleaning up or doing things. So I'm really familiar with the album before I even start. Like listening is the most important part of mastering and more, more important than in recording and mixing. Mixing is the most, the most important part because you can't start working on it until you know exactly how it sounds and how all those frequencies work. And you have a personal connection with, with the frequencies and the music itself, because the music's what genre it is and what, and what instrumentation is, is really important. You know, if you, there's a cello in there somewhere, you gotta be really careful with one K because it'll push up that cello. And that's not necessarily what the, what the uh, engineer wanted, even though it might sound great on the vocal, you don't want to have that cello overwhelmed or become too honky sounding. So yeah, listening is the most important part. Uh, I'll try to combine two questions in the chat. Um, uh, you, I think you, you basically mentioned that you're using inflator, I think as the last plugin in the chain. Uh, is that really, is that the case that that's always like, you know, you're always using a, a limiter at the end and probably that one or perhaps another one. Uh, and do you have any experience with the Sony Oxford limiter as opposed to the inflator in that role? Okay, yes. So, um, okay, so here's where my, my lack of technical knowledge really comes into play here. And this is why I use the inflator at the end because um, I don't really know what it does. I, I, I read the manual years ago. It's an old, old, old plugin. Like it's like a 20 year old plugin, but it does something like magical. So I feel like, Using it after limiting adds either adds transience or adds the apparent sound of transience. It adds something back which the limiter takes away. And I find if I put that limiter at 50% parallel, it does that even more so. It adds apparent volume, volume that it doesn't actually really raise it. So if it raises the volume by one dB, it sounds like it's raising the volume three dBs. Um, and because you have effect and then curve, like I have no idea what the, those things do. So you're just setting them till they sound right. And so I find that's a relatively new thing for me. So in the past three years, putting the inflator on after limiting, um, it does something. Now the, 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 the Oxford limiter is like a limiter with the inflator built into it, as far as I understand, but it has a little less control. But I find, I find, for me, using a um, uh, a Weiss or an invisible limiter, or I mean, there's a gazillion limiters out there. Really, frankly, it doesn't really matter which one you use. You can use whatever limiter you want. They all sound good. They just slightly sound different how they deal with volume. Um, so I just find I just go to the Weiss or the invisible limiter, and they both allow me to set at fifty percent, so I can go into the Oxford. But then. The Oxford inflator gets turned off for uh, vinyl. vinyl. The limiter gets set, set, set to zero for vinyl. So in a way, my volume is like perfect for vinyl before my limiters. So my limiters are bringing it up to the digital level. The lit, if I take off the digital level, it's vinyl level at that point, almost vinyl level. Question from Rumson. Do you hit 0.0, .0 dB full scale as a peak, or do you hold back to something like 0.8 dB FS? 
Okay, so um, because I'm doing the Weiss or the a limiter um, at 50% parallel and then going into the inflator, the inflator doesn't have a choice. Um, it just says zero dB, it's the only button you have. So I'm basically uh, limiting at zero. And then my, I think the inflator is uh, keeping true peaks at zero as well, because I have a, a true peak meter and I never see it go up. So it's uh, my true peaks, but I don't overthink that stuff. Um, whether you do minus 1.3, uh, zero, I don't think it makes all that much of a difference in the end. Like it's like, do what's best for you. Um, uh, Ian Shepard did a video recently about uh, True Peak and how it affects DAs. I, I watched it, it's cool, it's, it's great to do that. I don't like to think that way. So I'm glad he did it because I would never do that. So um, I feel like most modern DAs can handle anything, even True Peaks. I still see on Spotify, True Peaks, I see untitled True Peaks. Uh, True Peaks are there. Um, I don't think, it, I just, in the end, my answer to that is it, it probably really just doesn't matter. Yeah. Do what feels best best to you, but uh, it's just a, an argument that's just going to give you a headache in the end. Uh, the next question from Yakub, I think we covered what plugin do you often have as last in your mastering chain before you commit the bounce? Dave covered that a moment ago with the question. So moving on to Colin, what do you do to address phase issues? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, um, well, base phase issues are really easy to fix. Um, you can use elliptical filter or multitudes of plugins out there that fix that. Uh, phase issues within a song. Uh, sorry, within the frequency range above bass, like middle, mid or high frequency, a little more uh, tricky. Um, you can use mid side sometimes to do that. So if you have a phase issue, um, like say at 4K, sometimes you can go to the side and attenuate 4K and it can help it. Um, but uh, if you have something out of phase, um, there's nothing that can fix that. Uh, it, you have to go back to the mix. So the problem, the thing about phase issues is why as a mastering engineer, you have to understand about uh, phase problems and phase really well, is that you have to know when it's time to go tell the artist and the engineer that there's a problem there or be aware of it. So for example, a few weeks ago, um, there was a, 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 an acoustic guitar was out of phase and we, figured out it was because uh, they had a, a delay, they had a stereo, uh, a stereo effect on it and the delay was set wrong. So, or, or a stereo effect and a delay, and it basically knocked the acoustic guitar out of phase. The mono acoustic guitar, they, they stereoized. I mean, in the end, there's nothing I can do about that. So I had to ask them, I go, look, are you okay with the way this sounds in mono? And they just decided that, uh, Okay, the mono version doesn't have any acoustic guitar so uh it's like a bonus you know it's like the stereo version has acoustic guitar the mono version does not so it was just like but you can't really there, there are a couple tools that allow you to fix phase um they don't sound great um if it's a left right issue um overall you can do uh in rx you can uh, do phase rotation or you can do a uh, alignment fix in rx uh, advanced there's a alignment fix which works amazing that's more if there's like a tape issue, uh, an alignment tape issue. And sometimes people have an alignment issue or something that could be fixed by alignment um, in a, even a digital recording um, if they had a left right imbalance somewhere along the way. Um, but individual phase issues, there's real, other than bass, there's not really much you can do about it. I remember but, doing a, an album once uh, where one particular song, there was a drum fill and the toms just went really phasey. And it's just like, that can't be right. And it, it was one of those, you got to pick up the phone and talk to the engineer and say, what's going on here? Oh, shit. Yeah, I forgot to flip the phase on the Tom mics underneath for that one. I'll just bounce out. I mean, all he did was bounce out, you know, the same thing in the DAW, but flip the phase on there. And I lined it up and it was perfect. You know, why, why screw around with, you know, with tools when you can just ask for the for a bounce? Yeah. And also understanding that most phase issues will be fine cutting the vinyl except for bass. Like uh, if they're because most other phase issues are usually 
fairly minor. You know, it's like, uh, um, but uh, if base is out of phase, you're not going to cut it for vinyl. Like it's got has to be fixed. So there's no no way around that unless you want your your needle jumping out of the, the jumping out of the record. On that, on that note, asking the engineer to go back and fix something in the mix, do you tend to get uh, engineers offering yes, you stems so up front these stems. days, or is that something that you uh, appreciate or you'd prefer not to get involved with? Uh, actually, um, I ask people to send stems if they're unsure of the mix, so an inex inexperienced mixer um, or artist mix. Um, I, I say, I always tell people that I go send stems if you're unsure about the mix. And again, it's something I don't actually charge any extra for. Um, I just can, it allows me to do little tweaks to the individual instruments rather than do everything. I'm not a mixing engineer. I'm a, I'm a traditional old school mastering engineer. All I know how to do is master. I don't know how to record. I don't know how to mix. And I've been working on my own album for about eight years now, and that's very evident in that why and why I've been working on my own album for eight years. Um, and it's okay. I don't want to know how to mix or 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 um, or or record, and that's why I'll never get into Atmos because it really requires that. So I'll let the uh, the younger people get into Atmos, and uh, I'm just going to stick to stereo. Um, but if I get a stem, it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. I don't, it, I don't even think it's actually that much more work. In fact, sometimes it can be less work because I have way more control. So I'm always happy if people send stems. Just when they send like 32 stems, then I'm a little more like, uh, I don't know what's going on here, but like eight, eight to 10 stems is great. And it's, um, I actually encourage it a lot of times. It gives me a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities. Excellent. A uh, question from Steve. Hi, Noah. Apologies if this was covered. Curious what your go-to is for analog EQ and contrast compare, for example, that Chandler EQ. Yeah, well, that we did cover it because the Hitsville is, uh, the Hitsville is um, amazing, amazing, amazing. One of the, the, the best plugins that's out there. But then again, like that, that um, the ones that aren't necessarily um, used for mastering, like the Helios or the API, uh, um, some of those uh, ones are really great. Um, um, the Precision EQ is really good, despite its age. It actually sounds really good. Um, uh, some of those old plugins sound great, like the Inflator is so old, and it's it's a, it's it's it just doesn't have to be a new plugin to sound good. So. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank of some of the ones that are out there right uh, there right now, but it's like uh, the, the that uh, that uh, curve benders. It, it is really amazing too. So between the Hitsville and the curve bender, uh, you, oh, and the, of course the Poltec. The Poltec's amazing. The, I I've heard every single pull, plug in Poltec, and nothing beats the UAD one. Now of course it's got that anti alias filter on it. Um, so if you're using it in 96k ron helped me figure that one out but it's using a 96k you got to be a little weary of that if, if you do have to deliver a 96k thing because it cuts off at 30 kilohertz but that i think that's part of the magic in it because it sounds great and if you compare the the legacy to the new one it just sounds so amazing and i've and i have pull techs. i've got a, a pull tech line amp uh tube amp and i've got a pull, uh, manly pull tech and an spl pull tech uh and it's 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 great. It's it's such a go-to plugin, uh, and it and it also cool thing about it. If if it's at Unity, it's actually about 1.5 dBs above Unity, and that is what the original because we have the original Poltex here, and that's what they did. The the tube amplifier brought it up at least one dB just in 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 neutral without any EQ in it. So it's very faithful reproduction, and it sounds awesome. It's uh, it's probably. Other than the Hitsville, it's my favorite UAD plugin. We consider the the anti-aliasing filter at 30K a necessary evil, if you will. Right. Uh, because if, well, the certainly the, the more recent plugins or the non-legacy versions, like if you ever see like, you know, the 1176 legacy or the Pultec legacy, and then there's a newer version, all the newer versions incorporate non-linear, uh, non-linearities in any of the gain stages. So that means that you're getting all these harmonics. And as you go higher and higher and higher, those harmonics become less about 
being faithful and accurate representations of what the gear did and just basically digital junk. So if we if we just let it go all the way out to 96 or, or further, depending on, you know, whatever your, your sample rate that you're working at, it's not accurate at all. And yeah. it's, to us, it's just garbage. So the unfortunate result of that is that, yeah, if you're, if you're you know, putting that on your master bus or whatever and, and sending it out to somebody who expects to get, uh, you know, material above 30K, yeah, it ain't going to be there. Yeah, that's only a problem for HD tracks and stuff like that. They'll reject it because of that. Yes. Um, but I mean, you know, it's like 30K is still pretty high res to me, you know, it's like, uh, so uh, it's, uh, uh, and uh, you know what, I mean, for what I do, at least 90% of what I get in is uh, 44 or 48. So I, I don't get in 96K files a lot. So people just aren't at, at the, the clients I work with, they're just not working at 96K. So, but I do master 96. I, everything is everything is converted to 96K. I, I work at 96 because my master clock is at 96. Um, but it's just upsampled. So it doesn't really matter in the end. Question from Yakub. How do you prepare your mastered files for vinyl pressing? Any particular inputs on how to mix down your files? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, uh, they asked me one one piece, side A, side B. Um, and uh, they have to have the bass needs to be in phase. You have to have a really good sounding de-esser on it. So it, the, 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 the more balanced the S's are, the less work the, uh, the cutting lathe has to do. The, the de-esser on a Neumann cutting lathe is, has a great sound, but it's a sound and it's a heavy sound. So if you can reduce how much uh, the Neumann de is working, uh, that's great. So um, I'd say like air on the more the dull side um, and get those mid sounding really good and the bass really tight. Um, and then I, I always tell people to deliver, deliver to the cutting engineer at minus 14 lefts. Um, we've been, We've been cutting at Lacquer Channel since day one. And uh, so we have a daily conversation with the cutting engineer. And uh, when he gets in files that are minus 14 lefts, uh, he's happy. He can either turn them up or turn them down. They're, it's like perfect for vinyl. It's a per I don't think it's a great target, target for streaming or di di digital. Uh, I like loud masters, but, um, but for vinyl, it's absolutely perfect. It has the right dynamics for, uh, for and also limiting, I mean, like, People will say what they want, but I don't think limiting ever sounds good on vinyl. So I, uh, I make sure limiters are off. Use a compressor instead. And you don't want those square waves. Like you can't cut a square wave. So it's, uh, um, it just doesn't sound good. I have a bunch of records at home that I can tell are cut from the, the di digital file and I can hear the distortion that square waves make and uh, I don't love it. So I think all, and don't forget, Every album you know and love from the dawn of time, dawn of recording till uh, the 90s was recorded without without uh, limiting, without peak limiting, without digital limiting, without those 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 types of square waves, every single one. And the, uh, and so many of them sound great. So it's like uh, it's something to aim for, not just something to try to get away from. Question from Matt. Um, do you offer mixed consultations as one of your services? Oh, cool question. Yeah, we've been doing that at Lacquer Channel uh, since the beginning. Um, we used to have a name for it, like PAP. I don't know, it's dumb. It's like, but um, uh, yeah, definitely. I love, I love doing that. If I can help shape your mix before it come, goes to mastering, even if you're not using me, like that's fine. I never give an obligation for someone to use me, but it's like, um, I love just helping people out. I love I love uh, teaching people how to master. I like uh, talking about mastering and like, but if I listen to someone's mix and tell someone from a mastering perspective what I think needs to change or just say, everything's great, don't change a thing because I'm only gonna tell you if there's something wrong, if there's something technical. And technical could also include kick isn't loud enough, snare isn't loud enough. Um, there's uh, some issues, but uh, I'm never gonna give someone mix advice, but it's definitely advice to make it better for the mastering engineer, I'm definitely into that, always into that, always have been. 
Excellent. Well, that's all of our questions, although I'll ask, uh, what volume do you monitor at in terms of with the Fletcher Munchen curve and so forth? Yeah, you know what? I haven't checked in a while, but um, last I checked, uh, it was about 87 dBs. I don't know what weighted it was, but it was about 87. Um, I probably go down to about 85 now, um, but I generally, um, my speakers are big, so I generally listen quite loud. So I'd probably like hit about 90 at, at its peak, but I, I take constant breaks. Like I'm not listening sustained for probably more than 45 minutes before I'm taking a 15 to 20 minute ear break. I'm doing other things. Um, when I'm working unattended, I work very non-linear. So I'll work on a couple songs, go do something else, work on maybe a couple other album songs. Like I'll just go all over the place and I'll like, it, it, so I'm constantly giving myself breaks. I'm an expert, not procrastinator. That's not the right word. I'm an expert like in diversions. Like I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'll work for like 45 minutes and then I'll spend 45 minutes doing something else. Also, I... I have my dog here. That's, that's analog. The dog. <laughs> she, she, um, she keeps me busy too. So we can go. Out. We have, there's a ravine um, right by the studio, and so we go on dog walks constantly. And uh, but I mean that it just means I'm here like twelve to fifteen hours when I'm here. So it's always a long day. But uh, uh, um, I forget what the question was, but that, I think that answered it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, the level, yeah, level. Taking breaks, taking ear breaks, most important thing. Any other questions from any any folks? Well, maybe while people might be typing, I'll ask, when you're listening to a song for the first time, what are you listening for in consideration for what your moves are going to be? I, okay, so, right. Uh, well, the first thing I'm listening for is just the song itself and not the frequencies. The second thing I'm listening for is any frequencies that sort of conflict with each other, that anything that sounds like honky or um, resonant or, or um, especially in the low mids, really listen, uh, the low, because once you clear out the low mids, everything sort of comes out. So I'm listening for, for, there's like two different kinds of listening, the passive listening and the active listening. The passive listening, I'm listening to the song itself. The active listening, I'm, I'm listening to the frequencies. I'm no, no longer listening to the sound. Um, and then, at, then the third stage is actually instrumentation. So I listen to the individual instruments. I identify what instruments I'm hearing. Um, it especially comes, it comes in handy when it comes to revisions. When someone says, can you change something? I'm like, uh, ooh, wait, hold on. Uh, can you change something? I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I I think what you're hearing is in the drum, the toms, or in the in the cello, or in the uh, in the in the upright bass. You know, so understanding what instrumentations in in the song, I think, is really important. But I usually do that after frequency and after knowing the song itself. Just it's more just the the education of the song itself and knowing uh, uh, knowing the song is intimately and 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 like. You know, oftentimes you hear something on the radio and you're like, it's like, oh, I know this song. It's because you, I've mastered it. And it's like, I haven't heard it on the radio otherwise. It's just, it's just, I'm, I, I know it's, and this could be like 15 years ago. Or if someone comes to me a song 10 years later and they want me to remaster it, I'm like, I know the song. So it really, I really committed. I think my, my, my song memory is better than my life memory. <laughs> With, with that active and passive listening, do you find you lose objectivity over time or that's where the breaks really, or, or you don't listen to it long enough to, to hit that point? I think ob objectivity only comes into play in the technical issue. So I think uh, everything's subjective. I think, uh, I feel like when I, if I'm working on an album, by the time I get to song eight, I'm, I'm usually using my like, uh, my left side of the brain. Like I'm using more of the intelligence than I am the creative side. Like all the creative stuff is done and I am i don't have that energy left. So I'm just, and it probably really helps because I want to keep it consistent. So I want to rely on what I've already done to do what I'm, I'm doing beyond that. I don't want to try to reinvent it. Unless every song was mixed by someone different, then 
that I reproach every song. I, I zero everything for every song. So, but generally, like when I master an album, the plugins stay the same, the analog stays the same, just the frequencies change and the compression changes. But the, the I generally try not to change uh, EQs uh, mid album. I try to stick, if I pick the Hitsville, the Hitsville stays on for the whole album. And sometimes it just stays the same setting for the whole album. So um, the Poltex certainly does. So, because uh, that Poltex, my, my finishing EQ. So it's only the more the surgical stuff that'll change, but I generally, uh, and I guess if you're using a transparent equalizer, it doesn't really matter which one you use. So if you're using like the BX did, did, did digital, I can have it on or off. But I feel like if I'm using like say the API on, on, on one song, I'll generally use it on all the songs. That's just the way uh, that, that's the way the modalities work for me. Thank you. Um, and when you get to the end of finishing the mastering of the album, are you then sending it out at that point? Are you sleeping on it and listening to it the next day before sending it back? I don't listen to it after I finish it. I, I immediately send it to the client because I, because I, I find second guessing the worst enemy. Like, like every time I've got, I've, I've waited till the next, unless I'm unsure, but anytime I've like, I've like, I'm happy with it and I don't send it off and I wait till the next morning, I want to change everything the next morning. And chances are the revisions get me back to the way it was before. So second guessing yourself is not, a, a, not good for me. Um, so this, the minute I'm done, it goes to the client, uh, assuming they've paid. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I try to second guess myself and I try to stay confident in the work I do. So, and then that's why we have an unlimited and an uncharged revision process. So, and I'm, I, I find that, I, I find when I send it to the client, that's like the mastering is pretty much like half done. Even though most I don't get revisions because I'm, I think I'm good at what I do, but, but I still feel like it's, it, it's not done till the client gives it a full listen and gives you your notes. You know, even if there's no notes, still that's that's part of the mastering process. So revisions are really important. And it's why I don't charge for them. Yeah, I often get asked, uh, you know, how long is this going to take? And I say, well, some of that's up to me, but a lot of it's up to you as the, <laughs> as as the artist, right? Like you, you this is the last chance that we're going to get to to do anything with your you know with this art before it gets distributed to the public right or wherever it's going so you you as the artist need to sit there and listen to it and tell me if I'm done or not exactly yeah um one one other question about your your monitoring setup so obviously you know your monitors incredibly well but being able to confidently say this is going to translate to pretty much any playback system. What's the what's the science behind that in terms like how, how do you quantize that that you can feel confident in knowing that what you're hearing in there is going to be accurate outside? Yeah, that's an awesome question, actually, because uh, um, there's a good answer for it. Um, so for this stage of my career, um, what really helped with that was the trin off. Um, because it allowed me, it allowed to re EQ my room and rephase my room. So it's very natural sounding. Um, before that technology, and there's all other things like sound ID and all that stuff, but before that, that EQ technology uh, and, and uh, uh, these uh, phase changes, um, it, 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 it wasn't as accurate as it really could be. The room was great, but the speakers were just, you know, subject to the amplifier and like just. The speakers sounded the way they sounded when, um, but when the, the room is 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 measured and EQ'd by a computer, it really changed the game. But before that, in my early days of my career, I didn't have multiple speakers ever. I always had one speaker. But really, part of the mastering process was taking into the car, taking to to a stereo, taking into a ghetto blaster, like all these different things. And I at some and also listening to other. Uh, reference masters, like uh, other other stuff. So now that I'm 23 years into this, actually I'm 25 years into this, 24, 24 years, I'd figure. It, 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 
I don't have to do that anymore. I don't, I generally don't listen to reference masters anymore. I don't listen to it in the car. I don't, uh, I just don't need to anymore. I, I did that work in the first decade of my career. Um, anyone getting into it, I would say, listen to it as many places as possible. And that's what I tell clients to do. Uh, when they receive their master, I'm like, listen to it as many places you can. It, my job is to make it sound good as in many places as possible. So it should sound good on everything you play it back on. Now, oftentimes I get uh, feedback that uh, it sounds great, but doesn't sound great in my AirPods. And then I'm like, okay, well, let me see what I can do. Let me see if I can make a tweak that can sound still good at everywhere else, but still sound good in your AirPods. You know, and I, at once I hear what they're saying, you know, or maybe they're just turning their AirPods up too loud, which could be that too. So, um, or their AirPods are actually broken, which is <laughs> happens pretty often a lot as well. So <laughs> it's like, doesn't it sounds great? Doesn't sound good in my AirPods. I'm like, well, does anything else sound good in your AirPods? Not really. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, <laughs> to your AirPods. If, a, if an artist is saying it doesn't sound great on a uh, playback device, are you trying to track one of the, those down or no. to be able to hear it for yourself or? Yeah, no, I just got to identify what the issue is. And it's, it's usually they're hearing distortion in that. And then sometimes just bringing the whole thing down by one dB doesn't affect the way it sounds. Like it's really just, just one dB quieter, but it works good on that si system. And it's just, it's just, um, it's helping them out so it's like because sometimes some systems just don't like some things are so cheap they just don't sound good and they won't sound good with anything you know so it's like and they'll be like well you two sounds good but mine doesn't sound good i'm like well you know you were you were you were you recorded at at, at home with you know with an apollo twin and 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 a sure sm57 you know it's like you two didn't do that so it's like uh, uh, that that's the main difference there. But sometimes if I can just do a little tweak to make it sound good on their system and it, it doesn't affect anything else, then sure, why not? Anything else? I think that covers it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very well, much for this. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I really, I really like doing that. I love talking about this stuff. It's, oh, it's really, it's the only thing I know anything about. So you're in the right job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, if I stopped doing this, I, 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 I don't know what I'd be doing. Probably <laughs> dog walker. I'm pretty good at that. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'd love that job to be honest. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your generosity of knowledge and, and time. This has been really great. Anytime. And anyone can email me, lacquerchannel at gmail.com. Anytime. If you're watching this on, on the YouTubes later, just like anytime, just email with any questions. I love talking about this stuff and I'm happy to answer any questions about anything that's mastering related. Fantastic. Well, thanks, and thanks as thanks. well, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Hey. And thanks for everyone for attending. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye.